All right guys, so we're gonna go ahead and start with the Torque Lab. And I'd like to point out first why I have a different color cap. I recorded this whole video and then realized I said the wrong thing and I threw the marker and broke the cap. So now I got a green cap with a blue marker. So that's my life. Uh, so let's get to Torque. So two things to keep in mind for Torque. Where's the axis of rotation and what is the force going to tend to cause the rotation? So torque is defined as any force that causes rotation or will tend to cause rotation. So anytime we need to assess where the axis of rotation is, and if there's a force that's directed exactly upon the axis of rotation, we know that this force here will not have any torque. Because since it's a force applied directly to the axis of rotation, it's not going to tend to cause a rotation in any direction. Now, the next thing to keep in mind is some of these values will come with positive and minus signs. So some will be positive, some will be negative. You completely disregard the value assigned to the specific force, and then you assign that value based on which direction it's going to tend to cause a rotation. And so the way that we assess which direction it's going to rotate is we lay our thumb where the axis of rotation is and you curl your fingers. And this is called the right hand rule. So when you curl your fingers in, this is going to be a positive torque. So we can say that any type of counterclockwise is going to give us a positive torque where conversely any type of clockwise is going to give a negative torque. So I actually have these labeled correctly. So this is going to give us a positive torque because it's, it's going to push the plane this way, which is a counterclockwise direction, which is a positive torque. Whereas this force right here is going to tend to push it in a clockwise direction, which is a negative torque. And this one right here is going to tend to push the, to the plane of axis here in a positive direction or counterclockwise. And again, when we're looking at these problems and we're adding the forces, so it's just a summation of all the torques applied, anytime that there's a force here on directly on the axis of rotation, it's not gonna have a torque component and that's really important to remember. All right, so I've cleared off most of the stuff on the board here and I'm gonna focus on just one aspect here. So anytime that we're dealing with perpendicular forces like we had last time, that's perfectly fine because when we assess torque, it's just the force times the length, which is perfect because we can use the horizontal distance between the two points. So let's say this is 0.5 meters. And then let's say this is 0.3 meters. And this horizontal distance is going to be 0.5 meters. Okay, so when we're looking at these, since we're doing stuff with force times length, we need to assess the, the lever arm, which is going to operate on the axis of rotation. And so the easiest way that I mention in my classes to do this is essentially take the, for any type of force that has some type of angular component, we're not going to use the horizontal distance between the axis of rotation and the end point of the force. We need to consider it more like a lever arm in the fact that it's going to be pushing down. So we have some type of force applied like this and essentially need to figure out what this distance here is. So for any type of angular force, we use the the force or the, sorry, the distance here, essentially connecting the axis of rotation and the force vector here. So when solving this, we would add up the torque of this right here, so the force of this vector times this length, and the force of this vector times this length here, which is important to remember any time that we're dealing with a non-perpendicular force or torque applied to some type of axis. All right, so this is the second problem here drawn out. So like I said earlier, the first thing you want to do is identify the axis of rotation, which is right here. So right off the bat, we know that this force here is not going to apply in, in our equation here when we do the summation of our torques. 
So in order to do the summation of the torques here, it's going to look like something like this. So it's going to be sigma t, which is the summation of the torques, is equal to, I always write it out this way, it's the force times the length, and then that's going to be plus or minus, depending on which direction the, the force is, and that's coming from the right-hand rule again, and the force 2 times length 2. So now we already know the forces because they're right here in blue. Now we just need to figure out which length to use. So we'll start off with the 70 here. So first off, we need to figure out which direction it's going to tend to cause a rotation. And so it's pushing this way. It's going to tend to cause some type of rotation in this direction, which through the right-hand rule is counterclockwise, so it's going to be positive, which makes our first force here, 70, is going to be positive times the length which, since it is a perpendicular force to the axis of rotation, it's going to be the horizontal distance, which is 0.9 meters. Now, for the plus or minus, we need to figure out which, dire which direction that this 60 is going to tend to cause a rotation. So it's probably going to tend to cause a rotation in the same direction, actually. It's going to cause a counterclockwise rotation, which again is positive. So we would add 60, now times its length. So what we need to do is we need to figure out which of these to use. So like I mentioned earlier with the, um, with the lever arm, so since it is not operating perpendicular to the axis of rotation, we treat it as a lever arm and we need to assess the length of that specific lever arm. In this case, like I mentioned earlier, is the connection between the force here and the axis of rotation, which here is 0.4. So we use 60 times 0.4. And then when we do the math here for this, we'll get the sum of the torques is equal to 87 newton dot meters. And so you'll use these same concepts and remember to use the plus minus here is just to figure out that even, even though here they say negative, we know that they both cause positive torques so we know that both of these are actually positive numbers. So remember to just disregard those in lieu of which way they actually tend to cause a rotation. All right, so now we're gonna move on to the second page of the torque worksheet, which is moment of inertia and angular acceleration. So again, it says draw the free body diagram and the mass acceleration diagram. Again, you don't really have to worry about that. Just know what it looks like and then how to read it and actually apply it. So again, the first thing that we're going to do is write down all of our information here. So we have mass, which is 70 kilograms. We have the moment of inertia, which is 9 kilograms per meter squared. And then our horizontal acceleration is negative 2.8 meters per second squared. And our Vertical acceleration is 13 meters per second squared. And so we need to find Rx, Ry, and then the angular acceleration. So just like we did in the past worksheets, is we're going to be doing stuff with Rx and Ry, so we should be pretty familiar with those equations that we're going to use for that. So we're going to go ahead and start out and solve for Rx. So our Rx is going to equal mass times the acceleration of x again. So our Rx is equal to 70 times the Ax, which is 2.8. Sorry, negative 2.8. And then so when we do the math here, we get negative 196 newtons. So now we'll do the same exact thing, but this time just with our y. And remember, when we're working with the y component, we need to compensate for mass and gravity as well. So we have r y plus m g is equal to m a y. So now when we fill this in, we get r y plus our mass, which is 70 times gravity, negative 9.8 
is equal to mass again, which is 70, times the acceleration in the y direction, which is 13. So we end up here getting ry plus a negative 686 is equal to 910. So now in order to get ry by itself, since this is plus or minus, it's essentially the same thing as saying ry minus 686. So we're going to add 686 to both sides, which gives us ry is equal to 1596 newtons. And you'll recognize that some of these problems have large numbers for newtons, and that's okay. So it's important to think about what the units really mean and what the numbers you're getting from mean. So we know that Newton is just a measure of uh, mass times gravity. So if you were to have someone that weighed 100 kilograms, which is about 220 pounds, just standing on the ground, they're going to exert about 981 um, newtons just by standing there. So a force like this is perfectly acceptable in any type of activity. So now the last thing that we need to do is we're going to use a formula that we haven't touched on yet, but it's in order to solve for the angular acceleration. So that is going to be the sum of the torques is equal to the inertia, uh, sorry, the moment of inertia times angular acceleration. And you'll see this on your, on your um, formula sheet but this isn't exactly what we need. So what we really need is this right here, is Rx times Y is plus the Ry times the X is equal to the moment of inertia times the alpha. And so you'll look to find the Y and the X values in the picture diagram that's to the right. And so, that's where you're getting the x and y components from, is that we're taking the reaction force in the x direction and multiplying that by the y, which is the height or the, so in the case of y, it's the height, and in the case of the x, it's, it's the length. So when we go ahead and solve for this, we have our rx value, which we found to be negative 196 multiplied by our y value, which we get from the picture diagram, which is 1.1, plus our ry, which is 1596, multiplied by our x from the diagram, which is 0.5, is equal to 9, which we we're given from the problem, and it's also listed in the diagram, times the angular acceleration. So all that's left to do is just do the math on this. So when we do all this stuff over here, we get 582.4 is equal to 9 times the angular acceleration. So then just divide both sides out by 9. And we're left with the angular acceleration is equal to 64.71. And angular acceleration is going to be in radians per second squared. All right, so last bit of this worksheet is center of mass. And the center of mass stuff is pretty simple. It's pretty straightforward. So we have some type of plane here. And then we just have various weights that have different x and y components here. And so we're going to use everything that we're given here. We're going to take the mass as well as the x and y component of each and then put it into one formula and then just that solves everything that we have. So for x, center of mass, and the y center of mass is gonna be the same thing because we're not concerned with gravity in this, in this particular case here. So our mass, one, so let's go ahead and work from left to right here. So our mass one here is gonna be 42 times the x1, which is the x component of its placement in the coordinate system, which in this case is 2.6. And then for any additional points of mass 
we just continue to add on would just be mass 2 times x, so its x location, plus mass 3 times its x location, and so on. And then all that is going to be divided by just the mass. So it's going to be mass 1 plus mass 2 plus mass 3 and so on for any subsequent masses that you might have. So when we fill this out here, we have our first mass here, which is 42, times its x component, which is 2.6. We're going to add that with the mass of the second, which is 20, times its x location, which is the 5.4. And then add that with the third mass here, which is 80, times its x location, which is 9.3. And then that's going to all be divided by mass 1, 2, and 3. So 42 plus 20 plus 80. So then when we do that, we get the answer for the x, which is 6.77. So I just skipped ahead and did all the math because it's just simple multiplication and then addition and all that stuff. So when you do that, you'll just do the same exact thing for the y component. You just take the mass, times its center, or times its y location, you'll do the exact same thing for the y. And then that is basically center of and mass. So I didn't mention this in the last part about the center of mass stuff, but anytime that you're dealing with the center of mass, it's going to be in some unit of length. So that could be meters, centimeters, kilometers, whatever the case might be. But that wraps up the torque, moment of inertia, angular acceleration, as well as the center of mass. So that's it for this lab, and I'll see you guys next week.